Good afternoon. Welcome to Spy Chat. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us. Today, our Executive Director, Chris Costa, is joined by Lieutenant General John F. Mulholland, Jr., who is retired. He is a former Associate Director of Military Affairs for the Central Intelligence Agency, but he is so much more. As CIA's Associate Director of Military Affairs, John served as the Senior Military Advisor to the Director of Central Intelligence, a career Special Forces Officer. He joined the 1st Special Forces Regiment in 1983 and led Army and Joint Special Operations Units from the time he was a Captain until attaining the rank of Lieutenant General. He served as Deputy Commanding General, Joint Special Operations Command, as the Commanding General, Army Special Operations Command, and as the 15th Deputy Commander, U.S. Special Operations Command. John was Commander of Joint Special Operations Task Force North during the opening days of Operation Enduring Freedom, immediately following 9-11, and commander of Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force West during Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003. Three, 2003. His overseas assignments included two tours in the former Panama Canal Zone, command of the 1st Battalion, 1st Special Forces Group, Okinawa, Japan, and the Chief Officer of Military Cooperation in Kuwait. So very international. We're excited to hear from Chris and John today. After they discuss the issues, we'll be turning to your questions. If you've been with us before or this is your first time, please just write in your questions through the Q&A. We will do our best to get to as many of them as we can, but I'm expecting a lot of them today. So I will stand down and turn it over to you, Chris Costa. Amanda, as always, thank you very much for the great introduction. So we have world-class guests every time we do Spy Chat, and it's a privilege to, to have our uh, wide uh, range of luminaries. But uh, this, this Spy Chat is particularly special for me because General Mulholland has been my boss, mentor, and friend since 1998, and he's been very patient. He's been my boss uh, for over... Uh, three times, I think, my count. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's like doing a spy chat with your your supervisor in some ways. So our our careers have uh, aligned uh, over the years and intersected. And I'm really grateful to have General Mulholland here today. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of his background, interestingly, when I make a book recommendation a little bit later. So I'd like to dive right in and talk about the stories, the big stories that I'm tracking from a national security standpoint. The first story in particular, uh, in fact, it's changing as I talk. I literally just saw a New York Times piece suggesting that the suspect has been identified for a massive leak of U.S. secret and top secret documents. Um, in short, the the uh, leaks of these documents is the biggest uh, story that I am tracking right now. It is extremely concerning and disconcerting at the same time. It undermines the United States credibility that someone potentially associated with the U.S. military has disclosed classified on the scale that this individual evidently has disclosed classified on a social media site. So let me just tick through a couple of the issues that I'm tracking related to this. First of all, we're going to, a damage assessment is going to take place by not only a the interagency, but uh, the Department of De Defense in particular. So there's going to be some grave damage um, already we have felt the impact, we being the United States in this case. Uh, in short, battle plans have been adjusted, logistics plans have been adjusted. So this, as opposed to past uh, disclosures, past leaks, has really affected the Ukraine battlefield, the battle space, Ukrainian battle plans, logistics, as I said. But more importantly, arguably, it's affected really the United States credibility. It's impacted other stories related to other countries, such as, I'll just tick a few, South Korea, Israel, 
Turkey. These are countries that are very concerned, Hungary, very concerned with the leak coming out of the United States. So this is a story that is changing, as I said, by the minute. I am confident the United States is going to identify the individual and the individuals that have been involved with these leaks. And in fact, as I said, it might be breaking right now from uh, U.S. Uh, from uh, New York Times and some other U.S. outlets. So I'm sure we'll have questions and answers about that. Let me jump on the next story. I'm not going to talk about this in great depth. General Mulholland, uh, there's no one that has more experience understanding unconventional warfare, special forces based on his background, and at the same time understands this notion of surrogate warfare. Now, the reason I bring this up is there was an article in the Washington Post that got my attention about the Pentagon urging Congress's approval of different programs related to surrogate operations. We're not going to talk about uh, the specifics of surrogate operations by the United States. Suffice to say, what got my attention is the fact that surrogate operations are have have been uh, done universally by many countries uh, throughout history. The idea of using proxies to fight wars, the idea of using surrogates to collect intelligence, the idea of using surrogates to support propaganda operations in other uh, military operations is nothing new to the special operations community. So uh, I just wanted to flag not only this article, but the debates that seem to be playing out uh, behind closed doors in the Department of Defense, but also in academic institutions, debates about um, unconventional warfare as well as irregular warfare. So I had written a piece that our team is going to share, a link to a Hill piece that I wrote specifically for this discussion today that underscores the debate on unconventional warfare, the debate on irregular warfare. But again, suffice to say, Surrogates have been used in, from ancient times through the Cold War to the present day. And more importantly, what I am comfortable talking about is the fact that Russia employs surrogates like the Wagner Group that we've talked about here at Spy Chat. Um, similarly, Iran is very adept at employing surrogates in places like Yemen and elsewhere in the world. So surrogate warfare, it, although it's ancient, it is also being used globally to help counter U.S. influence. The next story, I don't have a lot to add here, but I want to talk about the Nord Stream pipeline. There's an international whodunit, which is evidently playing out behind closed doors in Europe in particular, where investigators, the Germans, the BND, the German Foreign Intelligence Service, is weighing in on it. Lots of investigators from different intelligence services, Sweden, Denmark, are all involved with trying to figure out who sabotaged the, the uh, Nord Stream pipeline. Of course, Russia is adamant that it was executed by the United States. I have no way of knowing. I have no access to classified. But what's interesting is there are some suspects that have been identified, individuals that evidently uh, rented a small boat, a yacht, six individuals per perhaps had rented a yacht. They've all disappeared. Again, there's an, inter an international investigation ongoing. There was some explosive traces left uh, on this specific yacht. Some experts have said there's no way six individuals, even if they're expert divers, have could, could have uh, uh, actually executed such an operation in its complexity. I don't know one way or the other, but what's really important to note, there's other reporting, again, open source reporting that suggested that this was just this particular yacht was a decoy. But what it means to, to, to me, from my perspective, my analysis, is there was a sophisticated operation that was executed to sabotage uh, the Nord Stream uh, pipeline. So we'll see where this story leads. It's fascinating that 
sabotage is really a part of our vernacular of late as a result of the invasion in Ukraine. We've talked a lot about sabotage, unconventional warfare, irregular warfare, and our audience has asked us a lot of questions about this in the past. And that's a great segue to a counterintelligence problem uh, that, that broke out in Poland. The Poland counterintelligence service is very adept. In the aftermath of the uh, director of central intelligence going to Poland, there were some media disclosures that, that uh, not dis disclosures, media reporting, that the polls had identified six suspects. I believe it's now nine suspects that were planning sabotage operations on the ground in Poland, believed to be Russian operatives to disrupt the logistic pipeline from Poland into the Ukraine. Again, this would have been an escalation. This is something that we need to continue to watch. And this goes back to our discussion with Alan Kohler, head of uh, FBI counterintelligence, just how emboldened Russian intelligence officers are. So that's a case that I certainly found uh, interesting. Uh, the next few cases I'll talk about very briefly or next few stories. One is a total from left field story that I think is important in light of what happened in Mexico a few weeks ago when Americans were killed, caught up in a, a firefight between uh, drug cartels, a mistaken identity, if I understood the, the reporting that I was able to see. Uh, but the case I want to talk about, the story that's important to me is an MS-13 story. U.S. unsealed terrorism charges against men who are identified with MS-13. So what's MS-13? Is it a terrorist organization? No. Um, it is a transnational criminal gang that operates from El Salvador, but they conduct vicious attacks here in the United States. Some 60 plus uh, gruesome murders and attacks have taken place in New York alone in the Long Island region in the suburbs of New York City. MS-13 is a violent criminal gang and the United States is taking great pains to conduct, uh, conduct investigative activity to indict members of MS-13 leadership. All of that said, three individuals were arrested in Mexico, sent to Houston, and now will be going to trial. What's important for our audience is, although we're not talking about terrorists per se, not talking about a foreign terrorist organization, we're talking about a gang that operates like terrorists. So the United States, the Department of Justice, has leveraged charges against these individuals using terrorism-related charges. So that's something to pay attention to because some of my former colleagues believes the United States should declare uh, drug cartels foreign terrorist organizations. I don't agree with that. We can talk about that down the line, but that's just another story I'm tracking. Last two, I want to end on a uh, on a positive story. Um, actually, the second to last story is a positive story, and that has to do with Jeff Woodkey. Six years ago, Jed, Jeff Woodkey was kidnapped. He was a missionary, uh, believed to have been kidnapped in Niger. I was at the White House when we were trying to find out where Jeff was. He was likely moved to Mali. I'm not privy to the debrief from Jeff Woodkey's uh, captivity. Suffice to say, the United States and other foreign partners work to successfully ensure that Jeff is reunited with his family. So finally, some really good news that Jeff is home here in the United States with reunited with his family. And the next story, I'll just uh, underscore the importance of, of the Evan uh, Gershkovich story, the Wall Street Journal journalist who has brought up, been brought up falsely on uh, espionage charges in Russia. That's important for us to watch. Everyone should know that in July, I will have Ambassador Roger Karstens hopefully join us for a spy chat and we'll talk about wrongful detainees. But certainly this is a, a political case. Uh, this journalist is considered a wrongfully detained. This is typical of Russia, Myanmar and other countries that are politicizing uh, hostage taking, frankly, and are using U.S. citizens as pause in 
or as uh, pawns in the international back and forth of uh, trying to have leverage with the United States. So that's an awful lot. I covered a lot of ground. I want to offer two endorsements for for books. Normally, I recommend only one book, but I want to talk about a book called <clears throat> Surrogate Warfare, The Transformation of War in the 21st Century. If you're interested in this notion of surrogate warfare throughout history, the importance of proxies and surrogates, I highly recommend uh, recommend uh, the book that I just referenced. And then another book that I strongly recommend, we don't talk enough about leadership, is a book called Paragraph 3, which talks about preparing future leaders for dealing with an uncertain world. General Mulholland it figures prominently in this book, and it tells his story that we in the special operations community know so well. But I think it's really important to not only hear General Mulholland's insights, but also understand his background when he was a colonel leading 5th Special Forces in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. It was a colonel with his team, with the interagency, with CIA, that figured out how to get after our adversaries, how to respond in Afghanistan. And it's a fascinating story of leadership. And over the years, I've oftentimes reflected on what then Colonel Mulholland had to do um, as, a, as a colonel leading 5th Special Forces. Much of what played out is legend now, uh, but uh, I think it's an important book to hear the narrative of leaders in the C-suite and also in the field. So I covered an awful lot of ground, but I'm going to turn it over to General Mulholland. Hey, Chris, thank you. Um, first of all, let me thank you for the opportunity to join you and your your team and and of course the uh, the great audience that uh, tunes into your your spy chat to, to hopefully contribute to some small degree the uh, the extraordinary reputation you've you've earned uh, with, with this outstanding series. So thank you. Um, where would you like me to begin? Anything in particular? Where I should a start point? I have a couple things in mind, but what, what would you like me to perhaps start with? Sir, I think whatever you're comfortable with uh, jumping on, anything that you've been thinking about, but certainly, you know, I would love to hear your perspective on uh, Ukraine in particular, but really anything you want to talk about to include the the leadership that uh, you've you've exercised on all those years that we talked about, but then we will transition. So if you can spend a few minutes, you know, on, on that, uh, and then we'll take questions and answers, and then we'll hear from our audience, but really anything you want to talk about over to you. Great. Okay. Well, yeah, let's, um, the, the I'm, I'm joining you from us special operations command headquarters where I'm working with a bunch of my fellow old, retired broken SF guys uh, on a project here uh, in support of the command. Um, but the uh, the issue of surrogate warfare um, perhaps blends nicely with some of the uh, issues attendant to the war in Ukraine that we're watching um, and, and, and perhaps the larger topic of irregular warfare, which is very much what we're what we've been talking about here. Um, and uh, for for many of us, and I, I'll I'll, I'll have an excursion a bit that goes back to the the end of our operations in Afghanistan and how that came to an end. And uh, obviously, as a a twenty year plus campaign of of uh, of trying to certainly rid the country of the of the leadership that the Taliban leadership that uh, tolerated and hosted and supported the Al Qaeda effort that resulted in the terrible attacks of 9-11 and uh you know in their refusal to turn those actors over to us um, you know the decision was made to go into afghanistan to overthrow that regime and uh, re remove afghanistan as a sanctuary for for terrorists such as al-qaeda and of course now you have isis k in there as well um and of course it did not end anywhere the new way we wanted it to um which I think is a manifestation of the challenge that the United States government has historically had with the notion of irregular warfare and how to conduct operations and how to actually build the right kind of organizations to to wage um, means of warfare other than the conventional 
the conventional uh, state on state fighting. Um, bringing that back to Ukraine, you know, we're, we're watching elements of that be playing out where you've got um, very brutal, almost World War One like um, slugfest going on uh, in, in, in very much with conventional means, but also attendant to that are, are, are uh, are di a different kind of irregular warfare operations going on. There's you know, Ukrainian resistance. You, you, you just mentioned the notion of, of potential Russian saboteurs uh, in Poland. Um, other ab other aspects that are in the periphery where you've, at least in the open source, we've read stories of, um, of um, for lack of a better term, insurgents or, or rebels in Belarus conducting sabotage operations against Belarusian uh, railway networks and switches and the like in order to prevent Belarus to use their infrastructure to support the Russian effort in Ukraine. So you know, Belarusians who have decided to, to be um, at least to some degree on the, on the Ukrainian side or, or at least prevent Belarus from becoming a, a more active active participant in the warfare. So we're, we're watching aspects of, of the irregular warfare play out side by side with some very classic conventional means, you know, missile strikes, uh, you know, air to ground combat, air to air combat. And of course, just some brutal ground combat taking place in uh, uh, massive artillery barrages that, that rival the World War I era of saturations and, you know, armored combat and, and, the, and the proliferation of, of tanks, et, et cetera. So it's all happening at the same space. Um, for me, as a, as a career special forces guy, and, and, and of course, motivated by the ethos of, of Army Special Forces in our motto, which is you know, Deo Presso Liber, to liberate the oppressed, you know, we, we, we seek to find those other means in the human domain, uh, short of conventional conflict, which, you know, is so terrible. I mean, all war is terrible, but the, the scale of the death and destruction, of course, rises algorithmically at, at, at the conventional level. And how, how do we, how do, do we, the United States, um, achieve policy objectives for our country first and foremost, but also for friends and allies and, and, and seeking to do other things, other methodologies to, um, to try to achieve both the ends of the United States government, but also those of our friends, counterparts, and allies. So uh, the, the, the notion of surrogates, of, of, of using, and which I don't really like that term, um, it, 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 it sounds very utilitarian. And, uh, and for us, when we work with our, with our indigenous counterparts, you know, it's a very personal business. You know, these, are, these are men and women who, who uh, when we do work with our, our counterparts, they, they, we, we identify very closely with them. They are, you know, they're, these are leave, living, breathing humans who uh, we, we work very hard to make sure that, uh, that we take care of them and, and make them as secure as they possibly can, but are able to do things that perhaps we cannot either because of constraints or just the situation, you know, the security situation on the ground. Um, it, we're watching it all play out in one way, shape, or form in, in Ukraine. Um, and it is a fact of life. It's an ancient form of warfare. If you, if you highlight in your comments that uh, the use of surrogates and proxies is, 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 is as old as warfare itself. Um, you know, armies and, and count, countries and nation states uh, throughout time have um, seen the utility of using uh, people from ind indigenous to a particular region to, to support or in some way uh, obfuscate or, or defeat uh, an, an adversary or use it uh, in, in some way in advance of those, the statecraft of, the, of those countries. Um, happy to talk about that or take uh, comments about that uh, later on as we, as we go through the program. Um, you mentioned the MS-13, I'll just touch base on that, and, and, and on perhaps a manifestation that's a little bit different than, than the horrors of what they can, of, of what the, the terrorist, that, that terrorist-like gang executes here in our country and, and, in, and back at home in El Salvador. That we, we always have to be mindful of it. That's a manifestation of the consequence of some of these brutal wars, right? Military-aged men who probably at one point in time, at least maybe they're, they're the fathers of these gang members uh, at, at this point who, who, who uh, in the wake of the insurgency in El Salvador and, and the, the, the faltering peace that came out of that, that you know, there, there was fairly fragile, but now without work, without meaningful uh, uh, means of, of uh, employment and, and, and able to raise enough money to, 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 to have families, to sustain a family, to have meaningful work, to have purpose in life, you know, find themselves 
into the line of work that they know best, which is violence. And, uh, and then of course that deteriorates and devolves into, uh, in this case, to this you know, very you know, terrible a massive gang that has you know massive reach throughout the United States and uh, certainly in our country uh, and perhaps back at home in El Salvador. Um, th this is all part of the of the manifestations understanding how these wars work and operate, and the United States is a as an entity has failed to really grasp and understand uh, all the different dimensions of what happens when these kind of wars happen, how to not just how to wage them and, and hopefully to win them, but also to how to under mitigate all all the attendant circumstances that stem from from this kind of conflict and, and, and one of these most terrible manifestations is 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 a generation or perhaps even generations of military age men who know one thing and that's violence and uh, without programs that that help to take fighters and turn them back into peaceful walks of life that are supportive of their country and, and rebuilding their country and and, and you know, reestablish themselves in, in peaceful walks of life turn return to what they know uh, which makes them vulnerable to exploitation by you know criminal minds and 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 other evil-minded people who can put those those talents of, for violence to uh, to nefarious purposes um, let me stop there Chris see if that uh, if, it, if that begs any questions from you or or no, that was a great lay down. In fact, you spoke about MS-13 in ways that uh, uh, were were powerful for me to hear. And I wanted to provide kind of a, um, a little more context. I actually had the opportunity, you knew this, General, that I had an opportunity to advise uh, the Department of Justice on some of their work against MS-13 in the last couple of years. And candidly, all that I've learned about counterterrorism work and our work in special operations uh, was helpful. But at the end of the day, the work that Department of Justice is doing is all about the finish being not kinetic. It's about an arrest. It's about using our justice system. But you're absolutely right. There are other issues that have to be addressed in El Salvador. And the United States shares some responsibility. There's an acknowledgement of that with MS-13. Uh, a lot of these folks left the, um, the, the fathers of MS-13 and the grandfathers left U.S. prisons, sent back to El Salvador. They didn't have jobs. They they came together in the cliques and, and worked together as as a gang to protect each other. So it is a problem multidimensional. And what's interesting, the only follow up I had was just to offer that El Salvador is an interesting problem today because the president has really uh, cracked down on gangs and he's really also taken away some civil liberties, but the population cares less about civil liberties, frankly, than they do about the wanton violence of MS-13. In other words, they're happy with the crackdown. I think MS-13, I'm sorry, I think El Salvador just built one of the biggest prisons in the world to house gangs. So that's it. a uh, story we should continue to watch. So that's the only uh, uh, piece I wanted to add. I think we can take questions and uh, I'm anxious to see what we have, Amanda. Well, I have questions, but we also have breaking news that they're saying that the leak was a 21 year old National Guardsman. And I'm wondering, cause I'll just cut to the chase on that. How, um, how would someone that young in green get that much access? Is that anything you would uh, want to think about or talk about? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. That's astonishing. That, that, that's very troubling, of course, and, um, and, and, and certainly not, not to in any way, you know, throw shade at our great National Guard and the incredible capability that, that our Guard has provided to our country throughout the history. Um, but uh, but of course, when you're talking about matters of national security, I mean, we we and, you know, and, and Chris and I and, and so many out there have you know grown up and lived our whole life in, in, a, in a in a in a classified environment and, and and mindful of our national security obligations to protect um, and safeguard uh, information trusted to us and and 
um, obviously more will be done to learn what position this young man was in, if, if, if the story is accurate, uh, and, and what gave him such access that he was allowed to, uh, to um, one, access it to begin with, but then to, to make use of it in the, in, the, in the way he did, as I understand over, over this uh, Discord um, uh, social media site. Um, that, that's, that's stunning. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of questions asked as, as people dig into this. Um, because we don't, um, there's always tension when it comes to how many people have access to classified information. Uh, on, on one hand, there's a desire to restrict it to the greatest degree possible. That's always a constant. You know, who you know, who needs to know is always the question, fundamental question you ask. But that the, the tension with that is always the 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 need to avoid choking yourself with so few people. Only, only a few people knowing the information that's necessary for a much larger population to conduct operations, so that so that your your, your operational speed is uh, is 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 equal to the speed of war, the speed of need, you know, the, the need to execute operations using sensitive material as part of the of of the uh, required information necessary to be successful in in whatever operation you're 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 conducting, whether it's combat, whether it's intelligence, whether it's logistics, whatever it may be. So there's this tension of having enough people know so that people can move effectively and understand why they're doing what they're being told to do because they understand the context, the threat, whatever the conditions may be and yet having that net restricted at the right level so that people who don't need to know or people who certainly should never touch you know secure information uh, are, are un unable to and uh, obviously that's going to play out here uh, obviously there's going to be more to the story um, how much that will be made you know public we'll, we'll see but obviously the government's going to want to and understandably and legitimately safeguard some of that but uh, obviously it's a, it's a shameful thing um, if true, this young man has betrayed the trust of our nation and, and certainly uh, imposed a, a great deal of damage on, on a number of different areas of, of consider, like Chris talked about relationships, et, et cetera. So um, I, I guess more, more to follow, but certainly a, a very, very sad event for our country and for our allies as well. Yeah, I don't have much to, to offer that General Mulholland hasn't already articulated. Uh, just it, it is a sad day. Uh, it is disappointing. It hurts our alliances. It undermines our credibility. And General Mahone's remarks on on trust is fundamental. At the end of the day, whatever safeguards the U.S. government puts in place, there is an element of trust that is paramount. And uh, also, it's incumbent upon others, all of us collectively, if you have access to classified, and I no longer do. I no longer do. Um, you also have to look for indicators of espionage and you have to look for indicators of insider threats. We we drum home these ideas of of individuals that might have expressed some dissatisfaction with the United States government and a range of other issues. So more to follow. Uh, but none of this really surprises me. Um, it, it sounds like this is going to be uh, a fascinating uh, case study and, you know, in motivations and why somebody uh, that uh, is relatively young, if true, you know, why this individual would find a need to establish his own virtual community and share sensitive information. There is a really fantastic article in the Washington Post that um, that I read about it that I recommend to anyone in the audience to learn more about the, you know, the online groups and how they meet. And, and I, this definitely got out of hand and you do sense that this is a young person out of their depths. What is likely to happen? What kind of, you know, sentencing is someone like this? If this is true, if it's the 21 year old National Guardsman who's release this into a small group. He shouldn't have released it to anyone. And then that group is penetrated. What's what's going to happen? Locked up for life? What what happens to someone like that? Well, just quickly, I, so we have time for other questions. But I mean, yeah, sorry, Dad, uh, this, this is such this, breaking. This, this, this young man's obviously, again, assuming what's been articulated is accurate. But regardless, I mean, he's subject to the full range of 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 
justice imposed by a uniform code of military justice. And of course, uh, um, people will dig deeply into motivations and uh, whether or not, uh, as Chris has, has highlighted, whether, obviously it'll be a look to see if, there's a, if this is an act of espionage, is this an act of just incredible immaturity and, and a, an exceptionally poor judgment that has put his country in such an extraordinarily bad way, um, but nonetheless a crime. Um, so they're, they're, they're well to way too early to, to say, but but the ranges of, 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 of options of our, are obviously severe that are potentially available uh, as as people undercover under under seek to understand actually what took place. One last question on this, and then we'll move on to the other materials that you covered. How I mean, you know, social media. Their spy museum alone has you know thirteen platforms that we're on, um, and my understanding is that certainly other countries try to penetrate our groups of people. Um, how actively is the you know, intelligence community aware of, of these platforms as yet another place to, to pay attention to. Uh, I, I, Chris might have a better answer to this than me, but, but certainly massively aware. I mean, yeah. it is the world we live in and it's part of the reality. And of course, these platforms are, are vulnerabilities for us, but they are also vulnerabilities for others as well. I mean, so what's a vulnerable to us can also be an opportunity as well. I mean, um, you know, it's a it's a un, it's a di very dynamic chess game that takes place in the social media and in the platforms that uh, that proliferate around the world are are just a fact of life. Um, and so, like like any change, we uh, a new reality. We have to adapt to it and and do what we can to protect ourselves. And also, candidly, we'll we we too will be exploiters of that as well. Yes. I have nothing cool. further to add there, yeah. Amanda, so we can move on to the next question. Yep. yep. Um, moving on, we've got some questions about drug cartels. Uh, someone wanted to know, Chris, I think you said they shouldn't be classified as terrorist groups. Um, would you, or should they be classified as terrorist groups? So I look really hard at that, and I looked at it objectively when I helped this task force out at DOJ. Uh, at the end of the day, it's not MS-13 in particular is not about political change in El Salvador. It truly is about protecting one another. It is a, it's almost a defensive network. Yes, they've been exploitive. Yes, they're starting to connect with some drug gangs, which is concerning. But the United States has all of the laws that we need to go after MS-13 and drug cartels without further militarizing the problem. Now, that's my take on it. If I was at the White House, I would have looked at this very objectively and and our team would have taken in all of the input from the intelligence community. In short, I just think that we have the tools necessary to go after MS-13 without declaring them a foreign terrorist organization. We have all the tools necessary to prosecute these individuals. Um, someone else wanted to know, oh, I'm sorry, General, were you gonna say no, something? No, I, no sorry. nothing to add, thank you. Um, one of our guests wanted to know how we would contrast MS-13 with groups in India and Pakistan. Well, of course, it's in the eye of the beholder to some degree, right? Our optic may be very different than, than the, the optic of, of those countries and, and different terror groups that, uh, that, are, that are active in that part of the world. From a, an American perspective, um, Chris said, it is, I think, characterized it regarding MS-13 absolutely accurately. It's a criminal organization. Yes, terror is clearly a part of their repertoire. That is part of their toolkit. But they themselves fundamentally are are are, are a, a criminal organization, uh, as opposed to you know, a, you know, it's a, a terrorist organization that that seeks to advance some type of political end state um, using terror as, as a primary vehicle for imposing a, a vision, an ideology, a, 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 an end state that, uh, that they're, they claim or associated with. I, I think from a U.S. perspective, um, not obviously speaking for the U.S. government here, but when you're looking at some of these different terrorist groups that are active um, primarily out of Af Pakistan into uh, against India, um, we, we, I think, rightfully 
characterize those as terrorist organizations because they are indeed um, their their motivation is political. Their their motivation is absolutely um, tied to either in a, a political or a religious ideology, um, however extreme. And their end state is purely terror for the sake of advancing a political cause, a political uh, ideology. Um, yes, their actions are still without question criminal, but but the the, the motivation, the the raise on debt, and sometimes the sponsor is clear because there's a political uh, 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 motivation and, and, and driver underneath it all. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a whole lot to add. I, I think that was very uh, consistent where, where I fall out on the issue. Without knowing which groups we're talking about, I would just argue that there's always a challenge of former terrorists, fighters, combatants, um, then transitioning to become a transnational gang or get into um, smuggling and other uh, criminal, you know, uh, uh, convergence with criminal enterprises. Absolutely. We've that everywhere from Ireland to Colombia. So it is a problem. Nation states have to always guard against. What do you do with former fighters, former terrorists? What happens to them? And as we indicated, MS-13 was born out of a civil war in El Salvador. Now I have a tiny, tiny question for you, gentlemen. Do you have any guesses as to what could potentially bring about a conclusion to the situation in Ukraine? Just a wee little question. Wait, wait, don't, don't we all wish, because that's just horrific what's going on. You know, short of... Vladimir Putin waking up realizing he's just committed one of the most heinous criminal acts in in, in modern history and and deciding to take his men and go home. I I, I don't know. Um, uh, it, at some point, you you at least I hope and pray that uh, um, he will realize that the, the, if nothing else, selfishly the the massive damage he's doing to his own country and the future of his own country. Um, I. I, I it's a slugfest. It's it's brutal. Um, I the, the people of Ukraine have just been incredibly heroic in their resistance. Um, but uh, pending a, a a significant change of attitude within Russia uh, to this, uh, um, or something dramatically changing the circumstances that causes Russia to real to self-assess or reassess, I I, I I don't see anything on the immediate horizon that's going to to bring this to a to a, an end, unfortunately. Yeah, and I agree with the general. I think there was a time where I thought that the that uh, the, you know the grinding war of attrition would end up bringing both parties to the table. But frankly, neither parties at this point I think are really interested in negotiating. So unless a country like uh, China influences Russia uh, to make some concessions, I think this could, the best case scenario is this becomes a frozen conflict. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's a bit of a stalemate. I was hopeful for a spring offensive. We'll see on, in terms of Ukraine, uh, but uh, this is a grinding war uh, of uh, attrition, and with a you know dug in recalcitrant uh, Putin uh, who doesn't want to give. All right, we have some um, far-ranging questions. Um, what do you think the world's response should be to the recent bombing in Myanmar? Is there anything uh, to be done to detour to, sorry, deter the military dictatorship from further attacks? I, I I've been head down in a conference for the last couple of days, so I'm miss I'm behind. I I'm not tracking um, a bombing in, in in Myanmar, which which is of course always tragic to hear. The, the larger question about what can be done uh, with with the, the brutality of that regime and how to curtail it or stop it. Uh, you, you know, again, very challenging question um, for the, the community of nations, right? Um, uh, obviously, the external measures that are available to nations are things like sanctions and diplomatic um, movements to to make life very difficult and, and, and miserable for regimes to coexist, to continue to exist, 
and and treat our people in such you know terrible ways um but then if if those are unsuccessful and uh, this massively difficult threshold question of to, to what degree our country is willing to intervene and in internal business of, some, of another country and 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 basically conduct you know, some kind of punishment operations military operations something to to help to bring the regime down those are those are extraordinarily difficult countries and questions and you know and truthfully the, the appetite for for that kind of adventure is 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 probably very very low um so um there are other you know means uh, um, available to governments to, to perhaps try to influence activities inside of a country um, that are you know, the, the people who know how to do those things know how to do those things um, but those are those are national level discussions that take place and and and, and have to weigh the risks and and of uh, and benefits of, of such things so extraordinarily difficult difficult questions and a and of course, the, the people of Myanmar you know, suffer massively as a result of it. It's, it's a terrible answer. I realize that, but there, there is no one clear, simple answer, I'm afraid. No, I, I agree with what the general said. It, the bottom line is there is no appetite, I don't think, for the U.S. government to get involved with any other entanglement. Just think about where we are with Ukraine. There's concerns about escalation on the U.S. part. Uh, the vast majority of Americans, if I understand the polling, they don't want uh, the United States, um, you know, military um deploying overseas. So what what is the United States going to do with Myanmar? It's going to have to use other leverage diplomatically, economically. We were asked a similar question about Ethiopia just a few years ago with, uh, uh, you know, how is the United States going to reconcile relationships with the Ethiopians? And we we kind of addressed it the same way. The United States is not in a very big way going to uh, intervene in Ethiopia, not with some of the other problems the United States is dealing with. That, not a great answer, I agree. We have a few questions uh, circling around the Wagner Group in Russia and wondering uh, what does it mean that the Wagner Group itself, which is a surrogate using surrogates, and um, also are there one or more groups in Russia that pose challenges to the Wagner group. So a compound Wagner group question. Um, obviously the, the Wagner group, uh, the Wagner group, uh, a, a state, a, a very, it is at this point now, very openly clear state sponsored circuit group. So the, the, the Kind of has lost its real distinction as a circuit group, group. It's obviously just an, another arm of the of the Russian military and the, and the Russian political state, um, but, but it's still useful to them. Uh, it gives them some very thin, very almost completely transparent now the, the veneer of uh, of separation from their actions. But uh, I, I think uh, their true separation from this from the Russian state really has long since disappeared um, but they are a tool that allows them to do things in, around the world uh, most notably in Africa before the Ukraine conflict where some of their actions have been uh, legitimately recorded by neutral and international observers to be you know, horrific and, and very brutal and then of course we're not surprised to see their the, the conduct of such um, uh, in, in Ukraine and, and the fighting over there. Um, they're a tool of the, of the Russian state, they're a tool of violence and coercion of the Russian state. Um, they're, they're, um, it seems to me that their repertoire is re relatively narrow. It's, 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 it's force. Um, to some degree, it's uh, a source of, uh, of general income, but certainly their employment in Africa, um, the, the, the terms of their employment came with access to, to minerals and, and, and uh, other um, forms of currency other, other than just dollars and uh, in terms of uh, you know, raw materials, gems, et cetera. Um, so very self-ingratiating, very much you know, in, in the corrupt kleptocratic style that we increasingly see out of the Russian state. Um, and, and of course, very few limits, it seems, are on them for the application of violence. No. You no, know, seriously, no, no consideration for the rule of law or proper treatment of humans, etc. Just a horrific manifestation uh, 
of, of, of all the worst aspects we've come to see now out of, uh, uh, not the Russian people, I, I, I don't want to go at length to, to say that, but, but certainly of the Russian state. Um, and I, I'm not aware of any other groups that would be a rival to, I, I, there has been discussion of the creation of other Wagner-like groups, as I think the, I've read that the, the Russian government now is putting an increased burden of responsibility on major enterprises to provide their own security. That would just be a license for these guys to begin to build their own private military organizations, it seems. So the gen general covered down on on the Wagner group, you know, proxies in Africa, that's particularly alarming. I want to get back to the question of are there any groups like the Wagner group? I would just say that you can make some comparisons to the Russian imperial movement. And just a, a little plus for my time at the National Security Council, um, my team was very much looking at white supremacists in, in line with uh, while we looked at the Islamist uh, terrorist threat. We also looked at white supremacists, and in particular, if they had a global footprint, that would make it a lot easier to do designations because, again, First Amendment rights, we've talked about this on Spy Chat, make policing First Amendment problematic. We have a constitution, uh, so we don't do that unless there's another crime attendant with it. I, I think I said that right, if a, if a lawyer is listening. So the bottom line, Russian imperial movement was a white supremacist organization based in Russia. It can be an adjunct to um, military objectives or political objectives of the Russian state. But it is a group of white supremacists. They have been designated by the U.S. government during the Trump administration as a special, I forget the exact designation. They're not um, entirely uh, considered a foreign terrorist organization, but, but they're a special terrorist organization. I forget how the designation is formed. So in short, there are other proxies and Russian imperial movement is a start um, if, if somebody wants to Google that and do some additional research. I appreciate the question. Yeah. And there were, there were several um, circula circling around Wagner group. Um, this is, I think you guys will be intrigued by this. Our adversaries engage in a type of warfare referred to as secret wars. How do our laws limit special operations command abilities? Um, uh, I, I would say only primarily in a sense that, um, that we are a rule and law-based country um, you know, the, the, the responsibilities and duties and authorities of the U.S. military is laid out in, in U.S. code. Um, it, it normally, generally captures Title 10, because that's the part of the of U.S. code that, that governs the Department of Defense. Um, uh, we, we are governed by the Uniform Court of Military Justice in terms of uniform members and and, and our duties and responsibilities to um, both ourselves um, and to the treatment of, of those who are under our control. So if we take prisoners of war, but in terms of, um, I, I, I'm not, the question's a little confusing to me. Um, nothing that prevents us from doing clandestine, which for us is secret or, you know, for, for or covert, uh, which is not, in the, the um, that, that's not a Department of Defense, uh, uh, that's, that's a tool of statecraft, um, but clandestine operations, secret operations, we conduct routinely. Um, we've been conducting clandestine operations, uh, I, I, you know, since George Washington's time conducted clandestine operations. So, so we, we conduct secret operations, we conduct uh, clandestine operations, and, and I would like to think we do them pretty well. Um, uh, not untied to the discussion about clearances, et cetera, right? Um, so short answer to uh, just a, some more for questions. We are, I don't think, the, whenever we constrain ourselves, we constrain ourselves as a matter of policy, not necessarily law. We constrain ourselves legally by adherence to US constitution and our responsibilities, um, the law of land warfare and the uniform code of military justice. So we, we will not, we will, we, we don't do illegal, Ill, immoral or unethical things. 
Um, and if we do, then it's our duty to, to hold those that do such things accountable. But, uh, but we do secret things all the time. Well, last question, softball, but very meaningful. Um, we often get asked by young people who want to go into the field for the advice of our spy chat guests. So General Mulholland, what would you recommend to a young person who wants to go and have, try to have a career that could somehow measure up to yours? Well, I for, don't, don't use that as a metric. Um, th th that's just the grace of God and, and, and the poor judgment of the United States Army. Um, but, but absolutely, I, uh, I, I can say this with a little bit of authority. I've, we have four children. Three of them are active duty Army officers. Um, all of who've been downrange at least once. Um, so so I, I don't think there's any more meaningful um, line of work than to serve the, uh, this great country. And that does, and, and I, I, obviously the military is the, the one I chose. There's many ways for, for a young man or woman out there to do that. Uh, but I do believe strongly in the sense of service. So I would encourage young men and women out there um, who are eager to serve their country. And if they choose to do so wearing the cloth of, a, of the U.S. military, the, then do so. Prepare yourself mentally, physically, spiritually, morally. Um, take advantage of opportunities there, of which there are many uh, to, to join the U.S. military. Um, prepare yourself accordingly. Um, uh, fix your mind on, on challenges and the ability to overcome challenges um, and, 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 and persevere. Um, you will have no greater reward than to, to serve along some of America's best men and women um you, you will be doing god's work and and sustaining this great republic by being able to to, to serve in some capacity to defend her from uh from those who would like to see us uh see, did, did disappear from the face of the earth unfortunately which there are, there are several so uh, I, I encourage young men and women to by all means explore the military as, as a uh as, 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 a, as a, whether a full lifetime career or, or, or just for a short period of time, but you will walk away from it a better man and wom or woman, I, I promise you. All right, Chris, do you have any any final comments or questions for, for John? No, again, this was the highlight of our spy chats in the last few years. The popularity continues to grow, but for me, this was a special spy chat. So thank you, General. You know, I'm not going to call you John, not even privately. Just not going to happen. Hey, so, Chris, thank uh, wait, I, I mean, I have to say one thing. I did see one of the questions. I saw someone mention Billy Wall. So I, I, I got to steal a second here because uh, we did lose a great American hero here recently, a dear friend of mine, um, a, a, an incredible Army Special Forces soldier and, and senior non-commissioned officer who served this country at the front line from the Korean War through Vietnam and into the wars of terror afterwards. Um, um, phenomenal man, uh, a, a, a great warrior. They broke the mold when the, when, when the Lord made Billy I think Lord, hey, the, the, the Earth can only have him one of those at a time on on the planet. Um, but but a great American who who was absolutely resolute and 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 accordingly deadly in facing the enemies of our country. So he will be missed massively by us all. I am sorry I didn't ask that because and thank you for seeing it and commenting on it because there was didn't really know what to ask. So that that was was very nice. So thank you so much for that. Um, indeed, thank you for such candid, candid conversation. I wanna thank you both for being here. I wanna thank the audience for incredible questions. I don't think we got to a quarter of them. Um, and I wanted to say that our next program is in person. And it's on Wednesday evening next week at SPY. It couldn't be more different because we are screening two episodes of a brand new SPY show from Amazon called Citadel. These guys lived it, um, but if you want to watch it vicariously, um, there is room for you at the SPY Museum to watch it. And if you loved uh, this program, please consider making a donation to the SPY Museum our donors make these kind of events possible along with community outreach initiatives 
exhibition improvements, collections care, and much more. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us. Thanks, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, team.